it's not tight enough. I've got, I've got a quarter of the way there. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gary Wingrove. I'm the host for this webinar today. A few years ago, the four global national paramedic leadership organizations created a group called the Global Paramedic Leadership Alliance, or GPLA. As I talk to you today, I'll use the internationally standardized nomenclature that refers to all ambulance workers as multiple level of paramedics and to ambulance services being called paramedic services. This terminology is standardized because terminology varies by country, such as there are still countries using terms like EMT or basic life support that have no meaning in other places. GPLA consists of myself, the chair of the International Roundtable on Community Paramedicine, and the executives of the Council of Ambulance Authorities, which has jurisdiction of Australia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea, the paramedic chiefs of Canada, the Association of Chief Ambulance Executives of the United Kingdom, and the National EMS Management Association of the United States. GPLA has been operating for a few years, meeting several times each year. The associations use that time to inform each other what projects they're working on. One of the goals of GPLA is to not duplicate work. So when one country develops a position statement, for example, it is presented to the others and then a form of a statement that can work in some or all of the member associations is adopted and published. The last few meetings of GPLA have focused on COVID and its effect on paramedic services globally. We decided that we should open a meeting that allows for the direct input of paramedics, supervisors, managers, and executives from anywhere in the world to give us input on the effect of COVID, the response by paramedic services, and the resources that are needed as we move into the new phase of the pandemic. You are now attending that session. Today, I will play a video pre-recorded by each of the associations that will discuss the COVID impact and response in their nation. Then we'll have an opportunity for you to provide any response, questions, or suggestions that you have that will help us do global strategic planning in a way that will meet your needs. Our hope is to gather information that will allow us to split up work between the association and then publish helpful tools globally. We're going to use the chat box as the process for you to submit response questions or suggestions. And then um, we will compile those and after the videos are, are played, uh, then we'll have a question and answer session where we'll go through each of uh, the items that has been presented in the chat box. But if there are similar questions or ideas, um, we're, we're going to wrap them into one concept um, rather than read them individually. So if we don't read your question individually, it's because uh, we think it's been covered um, in another area. So we're going to start now and we're going to do the videos of the um, for associations, we're going to do them in country order. And uh, so first, we're going to hear from the Council of Ambulance Authorities of uh, Australasia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea. Hello, everyone, and greetings from Australia. It's 6 o'clock in the morning over here, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to join with uh, all of you to um, share some of our experiences with uh, COVID-19 in Australia and New Zealand. Um, as an island nation, it's fair to say that Australia has, um, um, and New Zealand have been largely protected um, from COVID-19 up until this point, um, as a result of uh, being able to close our borders and limit uh, movement in and out of the country. Um, Did I lose that, Gary, or what happened there? We have uh, zero coding to communicate. Can you not hear it? No, it's back on now. We have fundamentally changed uh, our experience here in Australia. Uh, we'll uh, we look at our colleagues in, uh, in New South Wales, for example, and uh, a few months back they've had a, uh, um, a movement of Delta variant uh, out of the hotel quarantine around the airport into, uh, into the community. And uh, they've seen a uh, um, significant increase to the 
point where both New South Wales and Victoria, which are also now seeing a uh, significant increase in cases as a result of the uh, movement of patients or people from New South Wales, um, has led to a um, uh, has led to uh, um, uh, policy decisions in both states that we're no longer able to move to COVID zero in again. Uh, we're having to now minimise COVID in the community and prepare ourselves for uh, for, for essentially what is coming and what many of you overseas uh, have been experiencing over the last couple of years. This graph just gives you an example of what's occurring in New South Wales. You can see there uh, the, um, uh, the, the since uh, June, uh, there's been a significant increase uh, in, in cases up to a point now where they're getting around 1,400 cases a day, uh, pretty significant pressure on their ambulance service, almost doubling uh, the amount of work uh, that they've been seeing, um, uh, and also putting significant pressure on the health system in New South Wales. Now, the, the governments up there are putting place restrictions around movement, et cetera, um, but, um, and that's limited some of the strength, but certainly, uh, certainly we're still spreading and growing in that community, although there's some favourable data coming out in the last few days to, to see a downturn in cases and not for any for New South Wales colleagues, that that will, uh, uh, that will, uh, that will sustain. The driver of that is obviously vaccination, and we're heavily I'm talking about the delegate we're pushing vaccination uh, right through uh, the country at the moment. If you look at uh, the Victorian experience, um, uh, um, uh, we've uh, um, had more um, heavy restrictions in our state. We've been in uh, the lockdown restrictions um, where we can't move more than five kilometres away from uh, from our home. Uh, everyone works from home unless they uh, unless they must work in the essential worker, um, and that has limited the spread of the virus. But we're still seeing uh, cases uh, the cases in Victoria at the moment, 400 cases a day, uh, and we expect um, uh, we expect that um, uh, projections. Through to October in Victoria, we'll see um, uh, we're close to uh, 18,000 active cases and 800 patients in hospital. So it's a, um, um, it's, it's impacting on us uh, in a way that we hoped it wouldn't. Uh, but the Delta variant has clearly changed uh, in, in, in the infection nature of this disease. And, um, the, the good work that we've done to keep it out while we're getting vaccinated um, is no longer no longer a strategy. Um, so a key one for us is obviously about vaccination. So how do we support vaccination? And how do we um, uh, to get our uh, community vaccinated? And I'll talk a bit more about that and so how we're going with that in a minute. But if I talk about the impacts of COVID on us, and this will be no different, I'm sure, to what my, my colleagues are talking about today as well, is it's had a profound impact on our people and uh, uh, it continues to do and we'll have to get and we'll, we'll uh, have the impacts beyond the pandemic uh, uh, into the future. Um, one of the key ones for us is workload and demand. Um, now, during lockdown periods, as we are at the moment, demand is actually down. Um, what we found last year during lockdown is that uh, when um, you'll see less movement in the community, less cases. But we're seeing a community who are um, um, persistent or not able to visit their general practitioners to get primary care. Um, they're not going in to have their medical issues dealt with. And as a result of that, when we came out of lockdown in the end of 2020, uh, we had a 23% increase in, uh, in demand in our, in our rural areas uh, and, uh, and an overall demand of around 6% in our metropolitan areas. So what we're seeing is um, uh, sicker patients, uh, more patients, sicker patients, because we hadn't been seeing the GP during those periods of time. And importantly, we're also seeing a uh, uh, um, uh, longer length of stay as a result of the acuity, which is quite significant. Um, I mentioned increased patient acuity. Gary, we've lost sound again. Uh, the resources and also putting you hear now? pressure on, uh, on, yes. the, um, uh, on our people. And when I'm alive, this is experiencing exactly the same issue. And having looked at the reports coming out of the UK, particularly, uh, I can see exactly the same issues occurring there. Um, I'll spend a bit of time talking about our staff because the COVID has had a profound impact on our staff. Uh, We've got a workforce who are also dealing with the issues of the families in the community. We're schooling at home in Victoria and other states as well, and doing similar things. It means that uh, parents are having to juggle um, uh, schooling their children by video conference with the, with the teachers at home, whilst also balancing the work and other needs. Uh, uh, there is uh, many of our staff with uh, uh, people that are half have lost their jobs and dealing with the, uh, the pressures of that. And we're also seeing a significant um, um, uh, just fatigue and tiredness. Some people are, uh, uh, you know, spending long hours in PPE every day, in emergency departments, waiting for transfer patients. And it's certainly knocking our people around. I've never seen a lot of public love work that has been this organisation I've been for 35 years. It is, it is significant and profound. And, um, and uh, um, um, we're, not, we're not through the worst of it here in Victoria yet. Mental 
people in our, in our community. So mental health calls are up, sort of seeing a, 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 a large increase in the mental health calls in the community. Um, mental health for our staff, um, we, we're seeing a, a increase in um, around 25 to 30% number of staff accessing our uh, mental health psychology support services to support the mental health during this period. Um, and, and you know, our, our challenge right now is that there is you know, people looking to sort of kind of see the, the, the analysis of the moment. Our peak is likely to occur in October, November, uh, um, and, uh, and then we want to sort of have a recovery period beyond that. But really for us, our focus right now is on vaccination. So how do we as a state get uh, vaccination? I have to say we will probably be complacent as a country early on. Um, so we missed an opportunity to vaccinate all of and it was something that was supplying the vaccine vaccines in Australia. Um, but that said, we've uh, announced the system for South Wales, which is the peak of the pandemic, I think, at the moment. Uh, they've got just ticked over 80% vaccination for their population, the first vaccine vaccination for the population. We've just ticked over 70% vaccination. Um, and, uh, and really, uh, having contact with a lot of the community about the fact that we're around 70 or 80% can start opening up our community again. Uh, in limited ways to allow us to uh, to both keep the health system able to operate during the increased numbers of COVID cases and hospitalisations that we're going to see, um, and also uh, uh, also to uh, um, uh, yeah, to just make sure our health system is, is able to sustain itself. Um, but there there are going to be on long term issues we're experiencing both in I think our workforce we've grown our workforce significantly to manage the demands, um, but uh, you know uh, I'm seeing people seriously questioning this is the job we in the future. Um, uh, Given the pressures around at the moment, we're seeing, um, as I mentioned, significant issues on people's mental health that are going to, I think, carry forward in many, many years, for years to come, uh, both in the community and our people. And we're um, uh, we're really um, looking and saying, what does the future hold for us now as an ambulance service in, um, when we come out the other end, recovery period after this, uh, this peak of the pandemic, and how we're going to deal again with those people who've had delayed care, um, which will put significant demands on our services into 2022 and beyond. So for us, um, I'm probably uh, reflecting very similar issues to uh, what my colleagues are reflecting around the world, uh, but, a, um, uh, but a period where uh, many of the peaks that many of you up in the Northern Hemisphere are experiencing we're into that now. And the next few months in Australia are going to be quite difficult, particularly New South Wales and Victoria. The other states have been able to largely protect themselves at this stage, whilst again focusing heavily on vaccination and getting our vaccine rates up. So this is a bit of a very quick snapshot of what's going on here in Australia. Um, and uh, uh, again, um, uh, just acknowledging our incredibly hardworking staff who have just done amazing things, I've got to say, under very, very trying circumstances. And, uh, uh, and you know, we acknowledge the pressures here under at the moment and the whole health system are under. Um, and uh, you know, we couldn't do what we're doing without them. So thank you. And, uh, and again, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat to you uh, this morning here in Australia. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the audio issues. It seems when I try to mute my own line, um, it cuts off the audio for the video, so I'll not do that. And I'll also try to minimize any background noise that might be occurring here. Next, we're going to hear from the paramedic chiefs of Canada. Okay, let's see. Here we go. I am Dale Weiss. For those that may not know who I am, I'm the president of the Paramedic Chiefs of Canada, and I want to thank everyone for their time in having discussion on uh, these items today. Uh, at one of the previous uh, uh, GPLA meetings uh, it, uh, that I was invited to, we actually spent some time talking about uh, some of the things that we're commonly experiencing during COVID, and it uh, became uh, evident that doesn't really matter where we were in the world, we were experiencing a lot of the same things. I want to talk a little bit about those today, and some of the three the three things that I pulled out of those conversations were that we were commonly under uh, seeing uh, increased event volumes, uh, absenteeism, and hospital wait times were increasing. Uh, so I'm interested to hear from the uh, international experience as to what those things look like. Uh, I did a little bit of a Canadian inquiry as to what we were seeing across Canada uh, in all of our EMS services. Uh, and relative to increased uh, uh, event volumes, well, there was a few places that hadn't really seen uh, some or much growth in their event volumes. Uh, some had seen 
anywhere from 12 to 30 percent growth in, in for, uh, events during the last couple of months uh, during this COVID uh, time. Uh, as far as increased absenteeism or staffing, uh, it was pretty common uh, that everybody was seeing uh, some form of staffing issue. Absenteeism was one of those things that was higher than usual, uh, whether it would be short notice type absenteeism or uh, leads such as WCB and others all seem to be up. Uh, some places that we're not seeing as much of that have uh, seen other things such as people actually leaving the field and going and taking other jobs and uh, that was creating challenges for them. Increased hospital wait times has been uh, something that has, al has also been a uh, significant impact in our EMS systems. Healthcare systems uh, overall have been uh, struggling as well uh, with uh, staffing and a lot of the things that we've uh, just talked about they uh, uh, created some issues for us in our offload delays. And we talk about those differently uh, depending where you are in the world, but uh, that patient uh, handover time is getting longer and longer for us, especially in, in major centers. It uh, has become you know, basically our number one issue. Uh, okay. For, to for today's discussion, I'm hoping that we can confirm that this is actually something that internationally that we're seeing. And uh, I'm hoping we can discuss uh, what we're doing about some of these issues, uh, what is working around that, and uh, uh, what's not working. Uh, just briefly from the Canadian side of things uh, on increased volumes, uh, we see this impacting all the way from our dispatch groups to our frontline staff. And the mitigation steps that we've put in place to manage some of these is holding lower uh, priority calls uh, so that we can get to the higher priority calls, of course, and uh, delaying transfers for a period of time uh, to uh, free up resources. Uh, and certainly the usual things of providing overtime and additional resources, although with the staffing challenges, those have been harder and harder to employ. Uh, and using uh, mobile integrated health as an option to keep people in community and not transport uh, as often. Pretty well known that mobile integrated health doesn't have one definition around that, so across Canada there are different types of services, uh, but uh, for the most part a lot of them are uh, focused at uh, keeping people in community. Uh, increased absenteeism, we've, uh, uh, a number of our services have uh, peer support programs uh, and look at the, uh, the mental health aspect of things and try to uh, bolster those in many different ways. Uh, absenteeism management has been uh, uh, employed in a number of services, although that's challenging uh, based on uh, where we are within COVID. There's been some sensitivities actually around that and, and how that uh, shapes up around mental health. Uh, we've increased surveillance and awareness around uh, staffing challenges uh, and possible solutions. So looking at uh, how our staffing is going several times a day and uh, looking at every opportunity possible to uh, keep that staffing up. Increasing hospital uh, offload times. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in talking a number of services, it's uh, increased utilization of supervisors at hospitals and trying to uh, be those advocates for the patient and transferring patients over as quickly as, as possible uh, and increasing meetings with uh, hospital staff so that we can share our experiences and uh, theirs as well so we can understand what possible opportunities there might be to uh, manage uh, the offload times uh, in as short as possible. Again, additional resources have been thought of as something that can be utilized, but often they are simply used up in uh, hospital wait times and creates longer lines at the hospitals. And, uh, uh, and most significant problem that we've seen, of course, is uh, they've talked about is the offloads, but hospital diversions uh, have become more of a norm than they have in the past as the healthcare system is struggling. Uh, and that creates longer transport times, especially in rural environments uh, across Canada. Uh, bed blocking, uh, the thing was talked about, so that's really weird. Either or 
Uh, patients are in there for a long period of time. And uh, there's just a huge need for more spaces in hospitals so that those off-load times can occur within reasonable times. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share briefly with you what's happening in Canada and uh, hope that our conversation today will actually uh, you know, first share what's happening internationally but look at some solutions that we might all be able to uh, add and employ. All right, um, next we will hear from the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives of the United Kingdom. Let me pull that one up. I'm having trouble with my player here. Here we go. Hi there, my name is Hilary Pinnin. I'm an advisor in urgent and emergency care and strategy for the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives, which is the membership organisation representing all of the ambulance services in the UK uh, and our surrounding islands. Uh, I'm not a paramedic, I'm not a clinician of any kind, which is a blessing. Uh, but I have worked for our, for our NHS um, services for 31 years now, and I have to say the last couple of years have been somewhat extraordinary, uh, as I'm sure it has been for, for all of you too. So it's a delight to be with you today to share with you our experience of um, the UK Ambulance Service in responding to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have 10 ambulance trusts across the UK, um, across England, I should say, uh, plus a little one on the Isle of Wight as well. And our devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have their own single national services too. All of our ambulance services provide urgent and emergency care responses to our 999 calls. And most of them also now provide uh, responses to uh, our NHS 111 service, uh, either provided by the ambulance service or private providers. Uh, but very much interlinked with um, how we respond to patients overall. We also provide patient transport services for our scheduled care, um, getting patients in and out of hospital for routine appointments and discharges. And we also have a national capability uh, providing resilience across the country for major incidents, mass casualty incidents, terrorist attacks, that sort of thing. So we're very busy organisations, and um, but a very small part of the NHS overall. We get that 2% of the overall budget, but we have a very big part to play. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but we have uh, clear career pathways for our paramedics now within our services, and we're very much moving towards multi-professional workforces as well. So we, a number of our services employ uh, nurse practitioners as well as paramedics, and also other types of healthcare professionals, such as mental health care nurses, uh, end-of-life care nurses. So we, we are a changing um, type of organisation within a very and a changing health system overall. And there's nothing to say that the COVID pandemic um, has slowed any of that down. If anything, it's just speeded up the way we are changing as a, as a healthcare and social care provider. The early impact of the uh, pandemic when it hit us in February was extreme, uh, I have to say. Uh, we were not unprepared, but for the scale of it, it hit very, very quickly. And uh, London Ambulance Service, certainly where the first cases arose, saw a 300% increase in 111 calls uh, and a doubling in their 999 calls. Um, so it really did hit very hard. Everything about it was exceptional. Um, we had to adapt very quickly. Operating models were transformed. Digital solutions to the way we deliver the care were implemented uh, very, very quickly, even though they were sort of in, in design at, at the time uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, we very rapidly had to increase our workforce numbers through bringing staff back in and uh, make some great use of volunteers. Um, working uh, closely with our fire service who 
came in to dry that resources for us to release our clinical staff to do the clinical work. And um, a lot of the things that we've been working on as a mapping service uh, with our healthcare systems in terms of creating new pathways and, and greater integration, some of those things at the time had seemed frustratingly unattainable, suddenly became eminently achievable uh, at all at great speed. So there were some good things that came out of the pandemic, um, but it, it, needless to say, it has taken its toll. Initially, in terms of dealing with the pandemic, um, NHS England, our, um, our body that uh, uh, sets the strategy for how the health service is delivered, really tried to have strong messaging to the public to be calling 999, be calling 111, and using our 111 online services to get advice to really try and take the pressure off our emergency service. And um, you know, there was, a, there was a strong message about staying at home, protecting the NHS and saving lives. And so we saw actually what in fact ended up with a, quite a significant drop in 999 demand, but the, the impact on 111 service was significant. Um, so much so that the, uh, there was a decision to create a national COVID response service, uh, which was set up by one of our ambulance trusts, our central ambulance service. It set up in a week. They recruited more than a thousand um, clinicians of all types, many of them retired or not recently left work, um, to come in and provide additional clinical assessment services to the 111 service so that patients could be effectively triaged, given appropriate advice, and signposted to the most appropriate response, uh, much of which was about not going to hospital. Uh, and trying to self-care at home. So there were some significant changes very, very quickly. Um, and you can see there how the impact on our volume of 999 calls and 111 calls uh, that came in over the two waves there, the first yellow column being the first wave and the wide column being the second wave, which was slightly longer. And I have to say we were more prepared for, obviously. But as you can see there, since the second wave, Demand has uh, shot up uh, to unprecedented levels like we've never seen before. And I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of how we're coping with that. But we've uh, had a range of uh, responses to our 999 calls. And what we've seen, um, which was over the last few years, the, these trends have been increasing for hear and treat and see and treat uh, solutions. So see and treat dealing with the patient in the home and either discharging on scene or referring into another service, anything that's taking them to ED. Um, those those uh, trends were increasing before the pandemic and they certainly did increase during the pandemic wave and are continuing to increase, uh, which is, we see is a good thing, um, making sure that we get the right response for, for each patient's needs. So in terms of responding to the pandemic, uh, there are a number of things that happened very quickly, bringing additional resources in. We were able to set up mutual aid between all of our ambulance services to um, help cover um, surges in call demand. Uh, so where one control room was struggling, they'd be buddied up with another service to divert their calls to them. Um, there were periods where that was pretty difficult because everyone was experiencing surge in demand. But it's uh, put a lot of resilience into the system now where we can help out uh, you know, in, in normal times where uh, we get these surges. New pandemic triage protocols were introduced so that we could prioritise patients more appropriately. A lot of our paramedics, um, particularly our advanced paramedics, were brought into our control rooms to really filter out some of our patients and take them out of the 999 system and redirect them to, to better services that were more appropriate. We are exceptionally good as an management service in terms of forecasting and uh, modelling for demand, and that was really, really helpful for the rest of the wider health system. We're able to provide them significant uh, information and, and pre warning for some of the trends that we could see coming to them. As I said, digital solutions were a big part of our response video consultations with directly with clinicians on scene to uh, specialist consultants made a big difference in making sure that we were giving the appropriate response to each patient and whether they needed to go into hospital or not. 
um, for our workforce, obviously there were significant changes as well because all of a sudden everyone was working from home and uh, the use of technology and home working um, had to be rapidly stood up and is continuing to this day. The impact, as I said, um, it was, was one thing to cope with the, COVID, with the COVID waves, but what we're finding now as a result of um, some of the um, unattended healthcare needs during the COVID waves is that we have a, had a significant peak in demand. This is impacting on us in, in uh, obvious ways in terms of getting our responses in a timely way where there's nowhere near the targets that we're meant to be meeting our C1 and our C2, our most urgent calls. So we're really struggling to keep on top of those targets, which you see in this last period here. And uh, handover delays at hospital have always been an issue for us. So they've been a big problem, but they are an exceptional problem now for us, tying up our resources uh, outside hospitals for hours with patients on board um, and unable to release those resources to respond to people in the community. So we're, we're really sort of experiencing the effects of the pandemic now in a, in a very different way. Um, as I said, we have accumulated and deteriorating health conditions that weren't addressed during the COVID period. Um, patients are struggling to access our primary care services, our GPs, um, or who are mostly um, still only offering telephone cons consultations, so they will divert to 999 or 111 where they think they can get um, um, to speak to a clinician directly or get a response on scene. We're getting a lot of duplicated calls because of the uh, increased demand. Um, patients ring it back to say, where's my ambulance, where's my ambulance? So that adds to the volume of demand in our control room. We have hundreds of patients sacking sometimes, waiting for a response in the community, and it's extremely stressful for staff in the control room and, and those out on the road. Um, the whole of the NHS system is now trying to pick up building, uh, pick up on the elective backlog. Good. Uh, we all this stuff. Going to have a for humanity uh, during the, the, the lockdown. Good. I can't uh, having a big impact on patient flow, and that obviously has a knock on effect on our other services. We've had restrictions lifting now on the public for some time, and our vaccination program has been extremely successful. We've been able to do that, but that obviously has an impact yeah. on. Um, uh, the level of demand, our nighttime economy has, yeah. has uh, obviously gone back, <laughs> gone back into life. Um, and we've had lots of people uh, going on holiday in the UK where they would normally go abroad. So we've had uh, big influxes of people into sort of low population areas and trying to deal with significant demand there. Our staff really have experienced an enormous shock to the system, I think, over the last few years. Uh, many of them it's feeling the burnout of that. We, we still have um, members of staff off sick with COVID or long COVID, uh, and um, just in general, just extremely worn out. And we're very, very conscious of that. We have COVID transmission still continuing. Um, we do um, have a, a, a large number of cases still, but I have to be said that our hospitalizations and our deaths have decreased significantly since our vaccination program. Um, and I think deaths so far this year, um, till July, were around 51,000 deaths, sadly, due to COVID. But only 0.5% of those um, were for people who had been double vaccinated. Um, so we can see that the vaccine is having a significant effect. And we're very pleased to be able to say that in our ambulance services, I think we're up to 80, the late 80s, uh, uh, mid 90s percentages of staff who will have at both jobs now. Um, coming out of the pandemic, if we are, we're not out of it yet, that's for sure. But the health service is really trying to bring things back on track in terms of the strategy that we were following earlier on. We have learned a lot from, from the pandemic in terms of working more collaboratively across providers, uh, integrating care more significantly, and that will really increase the impetus um, for, for delivering along those lines um, that were progressing relatively slowly prior to the pandemic, but are now really speeding up. Uh, we've, the pandemic highlighted some, some significant health inequalities across our populations, and that's a big area that we've tried to tackle now. So there are a number of things through the ambulance service how we can contribute to that. 
we are very much part of the joined up system, uh, providing 999 and 111 um, together, linking in with the clinical assessment service. We are really at the heart of the urgent emergency care system now, um, trying to uh, ensure that people get the right response uh, in the right place at the right time. Um, so there are some positives that have come out of COVID for us, but it has to be said that we are still dealing with the aftermath of it and we have winter approaching and there's significant amount of planning that's going on to try and ensure that we um, have a service that is fit for purpose to cope um, for the foreseeable future. And time will tell. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't gone too far with my 10 minutes and um, I'm sure we'll have an interesting discussion after this. Thank you very much. All right, uh, now we'll go to the National EMS Management Association in the U.S. Our last report is from the United States and the National EMS Management Association. We have three guests joining us today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Sean, the, the president of the National EMS Management Association. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Caffrey, the current president of the National EMS Management Association, uh, and I hail from the state of Colorado in the western United States, which uh, is about 6 million people, and I run a small fire-based organization in a rural area. And uh, Brian, the past president of NEMSA. Thank you, Gary, and hello, everyone. Uh, Brian LaCroix, the immediate past president of NEMSA. I'm recently retired as the EMS chief from a hospital-based system uh, that served a large area, over 1 million people with 911 uh, service here in our country. I live in Minnesota. We border the state of uh, the country of Canada to the north, and we are in the north central part of the U.S. And Pat, the executive director. Hello, everyone. I'm Pat Songer, the executive director from NEMSMA, for NEMSMA. I am also the uh, Chief Operating Officer for Cascade Medical in Washington State. We're a state of about 8 million, hospital-based EMS organization that also has uh, ambulance service uh, attached to our organization. Okay, before we begin uh, to answer the specific questions of the day, I'd like to give a little context uh, for everybody on the call about how the United States fits in with the other countries. Uh, Australia is about three quarters the land mass of the United States and it is covered by eight ambulance services. The United Kingdom is a uh, uh, small country, uh, four small countries. It's covered by 13 uh, ambulance services, mostly in the trust environment. And Canada is slightly larger in land mass uh, than the United States. It has 119 ambulance services, but there are seven provinces that are covered by single ambulance services and the other 112 are in the balance of the, the provinces. In contrast, the United States uh, has 23,000 ambulance services. Uh, so contrast that to 813 and 119. And uh, so that poses some unique challenges because of the rural environment of a lot of volunteer agencies. I just wanted to get that uh, bit of context. Uh, we're going to start with Brian. Brian, can you tell us what the impact of COVID has been in the United States? Sure. So given this, the, the, the structure that Gary just described, we've had a wide and varied impact in this country and, and a particularly a wide and varied reaction, which others will speak to. But uh, certainly staffing is among the, the, the top issues that we've experienced related to COVID, the number of staff members uh, like all of us, we're not sure what they're dealing with with this issue. Uh, had concerns with their personal safety, concerns with the safety of their families in terms of uh, being uh, infected with the virus, bringing it home, that type of thing. We also had very significant issues, particularly early on, uh, with protective, uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. There were shortages in the supply chain, and in some places in our country, there remain issues of supply chain challenges around PPE. Uh, and the, the other one I would mention is the, um, the impact that the vaccine has had and the impact on the, the politics of our country 
we are wide and varied with a long-standing history of uh, pride around personal liberties in this country. And frankly, it's, it's been a real challenge. There are providers and organizations who have felt um, uh, delighted to be first in line to become vaccine vaccinated when it was available at the end of 2020, and others who have been very hesitant to take that path. We have organizations who are mandating vaccination and others who are not. So the impact has been um, uh, one of uh, a variety of responses in our country. And um, frankly, we're in the midst of this. The, the uh, Delta variant has caused us a, a whole nother round like it has the rest of the world of concerns. And we're still really assessing the impact as we go. All right, Pat, given uh, some of those challenges that Brian outlined for us, can you tell us how the paramedic services have responded to some of those? I think in the United States, the response has been very robust with EMS, with uh, 23 million ambulance companies uh, approximately in the United States. Uh, we've had a variety of responses, but for the most part, it has been a robust response, but it's been very impactful, as Brian has spoke to, on our EMS workforce. Um, as many of these agencies in the United States are volunteer and uh, the impact of COVID either because of staffing becoming infected or just workforce resiliency. Um, we, we've lost volunteer services. We've lost uh, paid services across the United States. So it, it's been kind of all over the place. I think one of the more impactful uh, responses in the United States is we've been very uh, agile in our response with the uh, advent, I guess you could say, of telehealth in EMS. This is something that we did, uh, we were just looking at prior to uh, uh, the pandemic, and now telehealth, you know, it was going to take 10 years to implement, has, was implemented in a year, and has been very impactful for our patients. The other agile part of EMS in the United States with a, a multitude of uh, delivery models out there is we were able to navigate and still are navigating the pandemic with innovative ways in delivery models, um, including be able to deliver therapies into the home via EMS and utilize the uh, vast majority of EMS workforce that we have or diversity in our EMS workforce out there to deliver therapies in different uh, ways. Um, we're going to continue to struggle as we navigate through the uh, the workforce issue, um, but I think the pandemic has brought together uh, healthcare and EMS onto seeing things uh, in a different light and utilizing um, our different skill sets um, uh, as the unified workforce out there. It's also um, brought together all the uh, associations from healthcare to uh, our other partner national associations out there. Um, Going to continue, we're going to continue to have to navigate this as we work through the pandemic. Okay, Sean, are there any unique or special things that uh, some of the paramedic services have done that you'd like to highlight? Uh, I think just to summarize it, um, Gary, um, EMS services around the country have definitely learned how to be adaptable. I think we very early on learned how to support our communities through testing. Um, we've learned how to do inter-facility uh, transports with COVID patients with sometimes uh, evolving therapies, and we've definitely supported our communities through immunization uh, efforts. And I would also like to stress what Pat and Brian said about the relationships that have been built both locally, uh, statewide, and kind of nationally in a lot of places. And we've certainly learned a lot about how to monitor and maintain the resiliency of our workforce. All right, given the diversity and number of ambulance services in the country, um, wondering what NEMSMA has done and what NEMSMA plans to do in terms of education and providing products to the number of agencies. Why don't we go uh, through the list in the same order, and Brian, so we'll start with you. Yeah, Gary, I would suggest that NEMSMA sees our role as a sort of a clearinghouse of information. Uh, supporting our members with uh, just in time as well as relevant higher level uh, context of the challenging issues folks face. And lastly, I would add um, to also share that message of optimism that we are in the midst of a significant challenge worldwide, the likes of which most of us have never experienced. Uh, but we do have a sense of optimism that we'll get through this and beyond. And Pat. And just building upon what uh, 
uh, Brian just said, I think it's the relationship piece. NIMS was able to really connect uh, members to members internally and externally in the organization and, and, and probably help them with their resiliency and best practices out there. Tom? And I think our, our final challenge with our membership has been really to figure out how to play the long game. Uh, in terms of what are we learning from this pandemic and how can that help us build better educational systems? How can that help us do a better job with our workforce and how can that make us or uh, help us um, build uh, what the 23 billion thousand uh, EMS organizations? Um, but uh, anyway, uh, how do we improve all those EMS organizations over time? All right. Well, thank you each for joining us today. We appreciate it. Okay, let me see if I can get rid of, there we go. All right, um, we're gonna pause for a moment now and uh, we'd like you to take this opportunity to put some comments, questions, suggestions, and needs into the chat box. And then uh, once we get a few of those in, we'll uh, ask the questions and see what the associations think about those. And again, we're trying to develop a global strategic plan and uh, that plan needs to include products that the associations can provide to their members. So uh, that's what our final goal is. Okay, the first question that came in uh, surrounds absenteeism. Uh, can the uh, association representatives address absenteeism as an issue? Um, do you want me to kick off? Um, I would say certainly um, from, from our perspective, we, we've just taken it as, a, as um, something we can't manage at the moment in the sense that um, um, the historical ways we used to um, be managing absentees and our staff, the reality is that they're going to take time off at the moment and uh, uh, nothing I can do right now is going to change that because I can't fundamentally fix the reasons why they're taking time off. So we've significantly increased our workforce to grow, um, over the last year to develop a uh, reserve workforce. Um, so I've been recruited um, 300 paramedics in the first six months of this year and I'm recruiting another 400 in the second six months of this year. So. Essentially, what we've said is absenteeism is going to be up for the period of time, although it is down during lockdowns because no one wants to be at home. So they actually want to come to work. But as soon as the community opens up, they're out again. So it's it's been largely through additional recruitment to create a reserve workforce to backfill those vacancies, acknowledging that um, the longer term return to normal um, presenteeism and uh, reduction absenteeism is going to be about addressing the fundamental reasons why they're taking time off, which is largely uh, due to the pressures they're experiencing during response and the pandemic more broadly. All right, Tony, thank you. Um, any of the other associations want to comment? Thanks, Neil here. Uh, so as a, a comment around that, uh, some of the things that we've applied to this is uh, uh, we you, know, you typically would backfill in a lot of cases with casuals uh, and it varies across the country so I don't want to uh, pretend that it's uh, you know one model that we were addressing here uh, but like Tony uh, we're certainly looking at this with um, you know some respect around uh, you know it's been a long haul for people and they're very tired uh, and so they're taking some time off and so how do we actually uh, create an environment where we can staff the, uh, uh, staff the ambulances? Uh, we've had some success in moving towards creating uh, temporary uh, positions. So at least uh, people are committed to certain uh, shifts as opposed to just looking at casual, uh, you know, trying to pull people in to fill those, uh, those vacancies in short notice. Haven't had a lot of success with that. And, uh, uh, you know, looking at opportunities to uh, increase the uh, the level of staff that are uh, required at some level to come in to, uh, to fill shifts as opposed to just backfilling, uh, you know, as we hope to uh, in normal circumstances with normal absenteeism levels. 
uh, also, uh, you know, people are also under significant stress. And so peer support programs uh, and supporting them in ways with, uh, with uh, mental health programs is very important uh, to, because this is a long haul. We're not going to solve these issues uh, in a matter of days or in the morning. You're not going to solve your, all of your issues around staffing. Uh, we're going to have to look at this uh, for weeks, months, years. Uh, to be able to understand how do we actually uh, support our staff, uh, get them back to work, keep them healthy, and move forward from there. So um, we'd be interested to hear what others have to uh, say around that regard. Yeah, Gary, uh, Brian here. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. So Brian LaCroix from the U.S. Uh, I, I would only add that um, Sean pointed out in the recorded message about taking the long view we know that many services are struggling in the short time with uh, the staffing issues. And in our country, um, I'd be curious to know about mandating vaccinations in your country, but here in the US, there's a lot of variation like everything else in mandated vaccines. However, the majority of um, professional associations from all um, disciplines, from emergency medicine, primary care, pediatrics, nursing, have come out and, and taken positions supporting vaccination or even um, supporting mandates for uh, uh, vaccination of healthcare workers. That was not the case even a couple months ago here in the US. And it is frankly um, sort of um, divining the workforce. There are some folks who are going to leave simply because they do not want to be vaccinated. And you can scratch your head about that all day long, but it is the reality we're living through. We believe many agencies are facing 10, 20, or more percent reduction in work staff that are just going to leave the, the career field. So those agencies that are taking the long view, to Dale's point, are looking at that longer term recruitment. It doesn't help us in the today or filling shifts next week or next month, but, but there are agencies and encouragement and sort of a resignation that we're going to lose a significant segment, whether it be 10% or 25% when it's all said and done, that we're gonna to have to figure out a long-term plan for. And there are, amongst that, in that dialogue, I, I should share, and maybe this is not news to most of you, but there are some people who believe that's an okay thing, that some people who leave the career field probably are those that may not have, um, um, I don't know how to say this delicately, but uh, maybe this is not the career field for them. So um, that, that's just sort of a current day reality, but the, the solution in the short term is unknown and being done on a very fragmented way. Long term, uh, the solution, uh, the, the eyes are on creating a solution that recruits people who really have a desire to be in healthcare, that really understand the job that they're getting into, and then providing them the support once they get here. Um, so that that's one element. I'll, I'll just end with the question. I would be curious what other countries are doing in terms of mandating vaccination for your providers. Steve or anyone from AAS, do you want to comment on that first question? Yeah, Gary, I, happy, to jump, happy to jump in and then hand over to Darren. Um, it's, it's very topical in England at the moment. The, uh, the health and social care sector um, responsible you know, for, for a lot of vulnerable people suffered very, very badly in the first waves of the pandemic. Uh, there was an enormous number of fatalities in care homes and residential homes for the elderly uh, due to just the rife spread of uh, the disease. Therefore, um, as of today, anybody that's working in a care home is required to be vaccinated. Um, and that's just come into effect as of today. And it has caused a lot of tension. Um, and they are apparently seeing a fair number of people. It's a low paid work anyway. There's higher paid jobs uh, in retail and you know any other number of uh, careers. Uh, so people are voting with their feet. Those that don't want to be vaccinated are leaving. Um, it's not an easy field to recruit into because the, the, the pay is poor. Um, and more directly with the ambulance service, um, it, it, it's lovely to have the aspiration of selecting the people that really matter and ha have the patient's best interests at heart and are going to make a career in the ambulance service. Um, but I have a horrible feeling that with the current uh, way things are, that recruitment will be done at pace 
and it will be about getting people in that can provide a level of care that is satisfactory rather than perhaps the ideal we might have chosen a few years ago of really careful screening and, and really you know just picking the best um, it, it's such a shame that we can't pick paramedics off the shelf it's such a shame that we can't get call takers um, from the job center you know these are skilled positions and and getting the skilled staff through the training is, is, is tough uh, Darren I think we you were going to say something similar yeah I was I was Steve yeah so, so as Steve said nursing homes are care homes and you can't get into them now unless you have had a, a vaccination or a double vaccination although the emergency ambulance service has an exemption to obviously go in, in an emergency situation there's also a, a consultation gone out uh, again this week from the Department of Health and Social Care around making vaccinations a condition of um, employment or deployment within health and social care organisations such as the ambulance sector. So it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what the views are in terms of that consultation. I think as Tony and, and Dale said, in terms of absence, um, I think we're in unprecedented times just now, aren't we, around how we manage absenteeism. You know, we've got you know, a tired workforce, we've got long COVID, um, we've got people who haven't had annual leave because we've had an annual leave vacation backlog um, as well. So I think how we manage you know, some of those challenges now will have to be different to how we've probably managed them in the past. Um, health and well-being has got to be front and centre of that, I would, I would imagine. Uh, and to compensate for that, certainly up until now and going into the winter, certainly from a UK perspective, it's about, I think as Tony said, bringing in significant numbers of additional staff particularly into our control rooms. Uh, we know that within our NHS 111 control rooms, so that's the control rooms that deal with the sort of non-urgent healthcare needs of the population. So they either go to the, the general practitioner doc doctor during the day or they phone 111 rather than phoning 999, uh, unless it's obviously something you know, it's an emergency. We've seen 30% absences in our NHS 111 centres. But they are inundated with calls and have been since the beginning of the pandemic, so they are they're really tired. Uh, and our control rooms, from a 99 point of view, are also seeing not quite similar rates to 30 percent, but certainly 15, 20 percent in some trusts in terms of their absence rates. So it's about bringing in more call handlers for the winter and trying to almost double our number of emergency ambulances by upskilling our ambulance care assistants on the patient transport service. That's one of the strategies that we're deploying. Uh, I think, as Hillary said in our presentation, looking at upskilling some firefighters because the UK model is different to other, uh, other, other, other EMS systems in that fire and ambulance are very much separate in the UK. Um, and um, it's something that we are exploring. How can we use the fire service to bolster resources for EMS here in the UK? All right. Thank you, Darren. Uh, our second question is uh, related to the first one. If, uh, the question is, what strategies are there to support, recruit, and retain staff? And Tony, I'd like to go back to you to start with because I just can't imagine trying to re recruit uh, six or seven hundred paramedics. Could you tell us um, how many paramedics uh, Angeles Victoria has and um, how you go about recruiting such large numbers of people into your workforce? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, so we've got around five and a half thousand paramedics and about 1,500 first responders. Um, uh, we're very fortunate in, in Australia that um, um, we've, we've moved to higher education. There is actually a surplus of paramedics who are looking for employment. So um, we've been um, um, uh, essentially um, been on a wait list for new opportunities for us. Um, they're graduating about, um, David can remind me, I think it's about two and a half thousand paramedics a year coming out of universities. Um, that are not all taken up by the ambulance services. So we've we've basically uh, um, um, essentially recruited as many of those as we can, um, uh, and um, uh, that's actually um, uh, the, the downstream impact. Though and it's interesting, um, Darren's comment about the uh, patient transport. The surplus paramedics that were not being employed by us were being employed by the patient transport sector, and we've denuded that sector by taking people who actually want to work for us. And so it's actually put more pressure on because I, I contract those services to do other work. So, so there is a there is a there's a pipeline work uh, um, uh, a workforce issue that we're working through in that sector as well now about not relying heavily on this cohort of um, individuals. But no, it's the university opportunities that have basically given us that uh, 
uh, that ability to recruit those numbers that were out there looking for employment anyway. They had been employed in areas such as contact tracing, vaccination, et cetera, but obviously their goal is to come work for us. A large proportion actually used to go overseas, but obviously with their borders closed, they can't work in the UK and places where I know a lot of them have gone over to in the past. Uh, so that's that's been our, our it's a fortuitous opportunity, I'd probably describe it. Um, I know most, most places don't have that pipeline available. So Tony, you said something that I'd like to um, get repeated for the North American audience who has been so far anti-degree for uh, paramedics. It's interesting to me that when Australia made the move to requiring a degree, your pipeline of new staff um, just went way over the top. Um, and so if you could just take a minute and, and talk about that change to the degree and how it affected um, your ability to recruit more workforce, I'd appreciate it. Certainly, Gary. So um, we, we moved um, uh, in Australia or Victoria initially in 2005 to um, uh, exclusive um, pre-employment university education. Now that did cause a few little issues early on. The pipeline was a bit bumpy for the first couple of years and we actually had in place nurse conversion programs also, um, the university based on aid nurses to become paramedics with a 12 month graduate diploma. So, uh, so we had some supplementation during that time. But since then uh, around Australia, we've got a um, um, significant number of universities. So again, I think it's around 16 universities um, um, providing paramedic education. Um, it's, a, it's a very popular course. So a lot of people coming directly out of university are doing that program, uh, sorry, the high school are doing that program. And, um, and it's created both two things. One, a more diverse workforce because um, um, we tend to recruit people that look like us, either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, when you recruit from a university, you're recruiting from a much more diverse pool because they, they don't tend to, they, 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 they bring in people with a much more diverse background. So it's improved our diversity. In fact, um, nearly 64% of my staff now are um, coming through are women. Uh, coming out of university. So it's changed the nature of our organisation. Um, and it has created this opportunity where more people are coming out than there are jobs. Now, that's been a challenge, but I've got to say it's been an opportunity at a time like this. Uh, and the view is the universities are creating a national workforce and an international workforce in some ways. I understand and Darren can correct me wrong, but 25% of the London Ambulance Service are Australian and New Zealand paramedics. So, so it's, uh, it, it's certainly, um, whilst there have been some criticism about um, people that are coming out of university not getting jobs directly with ambulance services, now a registered profession, there are those, they're being picked up in other ways. And certainly during the pandemic, it's highlighted the benefit of, uh, uh, of a paramedic workforce. Uh, and just as a quick aside, last year when we ramped up our response, there are 600 third year students in Victorian universities that I've put on, um, on in our books as well. So there's a, you know, essentially partially trained um, paramedics that we were able to bring on as first responders to supplement our workforce as well. So you've got those in the university courses as well as uh, those that are coming out the other end. All right, thank you. Uh, Steve and Darren, we've got a question specific to the UK, and it's um, what strategies are being used in the UK, the National Health Service, to address off-road times? It's a, it is a real, it's a real challenge that's just been growing and growing and growing um, over the last few few years. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that we've not cracked it. We have absolutely not cracked it. There are some parts of the the UK that uh, do slightly better with uh, handing their patients over, but then there are other parts of the country that just really get blocked up and you can you wait to offload patients for six and seven, eight hours in, in some cases. Um, what we've done here in the Northwest of, of, um, of England, um, so that's kind of Liverpool and Manchester, a population of about 7.5 million that I cover in my day job, We've, um, we've tried to employ much more of a quality improvement methodology. Um, so working um, with um, systems, so working with um, acute hospital chief executives and their executive teams, working with primary care, working with other parts of health and social care to try and bring them all together to look at it from a system-wide perspective rather than it just being either an ambulance problem or a, a hospital front door problem. Uh, and that before COVID actually worked and thank goodness it did actually, because um, over the last um, 19 months throughout COVID and now, as Hillary's articulated, where it's absolutely, 
you know, really, really busy and, and inundated now with calls, we're, we're actually doing much better here in the Northwest in terms of handover delays. We've still got them. We still have challenges, but nowhere near other parts of the country that have not been able to probably do some of that uh, quality improvement work. And then, as we know, what happens is it's everybody starts throwing stones at each other and blaming each other, and it becomes really, really, really pressurised. And we've actually, well, we're actually in the middle of doing a, a, a harm report just that Hillary might want to mention in a second because Hillary's been instrumental in being the author or the person that's been pulling that together. So basically a harm report that we've looked at a particular period of time, particular um, number of patients and we've identified quite significant harm actually. So we're in the middle of working with NHS England just now to work out how we publish that report as well as a number of uh, really high hit high-hitting kind of recommendations, if you like, as to how we improve the problem. Um, I, you know, today in the news, there, are talk, there was talk today about hospitals setting up tents outside the ED departments and a whole raft of different things, but we've certainly not cracked it. I think it's got to be reducing the, reducing the ambulance attendances in the first place. So we've got our part to play in that. And I think in the UK, We've actually done a great job in that. We now only convey about 56% of our 99 calls to ED. The rest of those patients are managed in the community um, and discharged or sent to other parts of health and social care and not through ED. Could we do more? Absolutely. I think we also need to stop all the walk-ins coming into ED because there's a lot of walk-ins coming into ED, which is blocking up the front door. We need to try and open up alternative pathways so as I say, it's a whole system approach. No, no easy answer, really, Gary. All right, and you referenced Kelly, I think. Does Kelly want to add anything in? Uh, Hillary. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, oh, Hillary. Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, as Darren said, we've we've done an exercise uh, just this, over the last few months, uh, trying to measure the harm that's caused to patients uh, when they're waiting in the back of an ambulance. Um, this didn't cover, I have to say, that the harm that's caused to those patients waiting in the community when we can't get to them. That's that's equally significant. I think what this has never been done before. Yeah, we we talk about it in in terms normally in terms of hours lost rather than the harm to patients. So I mean, in, in August this year, we lost 86 and a half thousand hours waiting outside hospitals. I mean, that's a significant number, but it, you, don't, you when you interpret that in terms of the harm to the patients, that's even more significant. And I don't think people have really registered that yet. I think we have a, a perception problem with some of our colleagues in, in, the, acute in, in the acute sector in our hospitals. Not all hospitals, as Darren said, some, some have really cracked it, but some just don't get it. They don't see it as their risk. They don't recognize the risk. Um, and that's the kind of uh, thing we're trying to get over at the moment is to really share that risk and get people to appreciate the, the importance um, and, and the impact on the patient. So uh, I don't know how we're going to ever make it go away. It, it's it's really worrying. We, we wrote a report in 2012, uh, which was titled Zero Tolerance to Handover Delays, and with lots of recommendations as to what needs to be done to, to reduce these, these type of delays. And they've just increased, you know, exponentially over the years. So a leadership, a hospital leadership is a big problem um, where, where, it, where it's not recognised and uh, where it is recognised, it's a whole hospital situation. People take pick it up and, and take it but as Darren said it's not just the hospital it's not just the ambulance it's the whole flow of the patient through the system so it, ne it needs a system approach and and that's what we're kind of trying to get out to everyone at the moment all our colleagues in, in the health service all right thank you very much so we heard from the UK and Australia on the last two questions let's um, take the next one for the US and Canada uh, it is um, is there any noticeable impact on community paramedic volumes? Uh, so, for example, are increasing community paramedic volumes uh, having an effect on um, reduced 911 or emergency calls uh, or uh, patients being redirected? Dale, do you want to take first stab at that? Sure, I can. Uh... 
So before COVID, uh, this was something that has uh, really come to light as it has for many places across the world around uh, um, uh, community paramedic programs. And first saying that all of those programs, even across Canada, are, are different uh, and they have different focuses so that it needs to be recognized. Uh, and uh, but they've been focused on uh, you know keeping patients in community and and uh, either preventative measures uh, or uh, looking at opportunities just to as I said keep them in community and uh, and uh, uh, away from being transported to hospital. Uh, so that's had an impact prior to COVID. Uh, we've seen uh, across Canada that uh, those programs have moved into. Uh, prevention and treatment in the COVID environment as well. And so where there has been uh, you know, places where COVID patients have been moved to a community param param paramedic programs have gone in there and done assessments and treatments uh, and uh, kept people either in these centers or at home as well. Um, these are relatively small programs. And so that's probably the limitation that's on these right now is that with a pandemic being extremely large and affecting a lot of patients, how does a community paramedic program that is relatively small and focused really have a large impact on that uh, without decimating your need to have a uh, EMS transport system? It has to deal with the large influx of patients that you have. So you do a bit of a balancing act to be able to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we talked about absenteeism and other things. And so you're, you know, you're trying to balance these pieces out into what it is that you can do because you can't be all things to all people. Uh, but, uh, you know, in answer to the question, the uh, uh, paramedic, uh, community paramedic programs do have an impact and can keep people in, uh, in the community. And sometimes it's about people keeping people in community that are not COVID so that people with COVID could get into the hospital. Thank you. I've seen some stats from one of the agencies in Ontario and um, their paramedic service has moved to one that used to be an emergency resource doing some community paramedic work to the number of community paramedic visits they do now, um, uh, having grown beyond the number of emergency callouts that they do. Uh, so they, they're a community paramedic service now that also does emergency work. Um, and I think we'll see that trend continue as programs grow. Uh, someone from NEMSMA want to reply to that one? Sure, Gary, this is Brian. I would say uh, I don't have specific data around the increase in, in uh, mobile integrated healthcare volumes. Uh, I can tell you more than anecdotally, uh, as you would suspect, and as Dale reported, they have uh, grown incredibly high. What I can tell you with more specificity is the impact of telehealth, sometimes related to mobile integrated healthcare providers and sometimes uh, related to other providers. I know of one uh, health uh, system in and around the Midwest of part of the U.S. where I live and work, uh, where an agency went from having a handful of telehealth interactions by, per month to more than 4,000 per month, and uh, that impact uh, the, the the impact of that for mobile integrated healthcare and, and paramedicine in general has been a decrease in low acuity calls. As Dale pointed out, COVID patients um, that would otherwise stay that would otherwise be entered into the healthcare system and take up uh, time, uh, provider time, and perhaps even beds in a hospital are staying home in greater numbers. And um, uh, I can tell you also that uh, even from a family practice standpoint, uh, which several agencies here have relationships with mobile integrated health systems in the paramedicine side there is uh, no appetite to go back to the old ways. Uh, even when there's an expectation that even if and hopefully when we are on the other side of the pandemic, uh, that uh, mobile integrated health interactions and uh, that the impact that telehealth care has made um, were not, are not gonna go backwards, they will continue to move forward. So that has been one specific um, element of mobile integrated health care that has skyrocketed in the U.S. is the use of telehealth. All right, thank you. Um, we've got 15 minutes left in our scheduled time. We have one 
uh, last question that's been posed so far. Uh, so we'll take that and then um, we'll uh, take a minute for the associations to give their reaction to our session today. So the last question is, um, is there any unease across the paramedic workforce uh, by those who have been vaccinated, vaccinated working with partners that are unvaccinated? And we'll let each of you take a, take a stab at that one if you can. Sure, I might uh, kick off, Gary, if you're happy. Um, yeah, it's, it's growing. Um, there's some growing unease. We, we've got 90% of our workforce vaccinated um, and probably only have around, I think I've probably only got about five to 600 left to, um, uh, to work through and about 300 that have declined vaccination. Um, I expect there'll be some health orders here in Victoria in the next few days that will mandate vaccination for all healthcare workers. So that will that will address that other group. And I'll be interested uh, uh, similar to what Brian said before, whether um, a, a number of those choose to stay with us or choose to leave, it will be interesting because there are some strong anti-vaxxers, surprisingly in my workforce, not a big number, but they're there. Um, so there is that there is some of that uh, that concern that's occurring there. Um, and I think uh, I think um, that's going to uh, um, that's going to to rise. Um, um, well, sorry, it, it, it was going to rise. I think the health orders will address that. Uh, certainly, um, it's being mandated in a number of other states uh, um, around around Australia, and I, I expect it will become a standard. Similar to what Darren said, it's already mandated for aged care workers uh, for the exact reasons um, he highlighted as well. But no, there is there, there was an increasing level of concern, but I think the the mandating of vaccination, I expect, which will come in the coming days, will will um, put that to bed. Would like to go next. I can take that, uh, Gary. Uh, so similar to what Tony has said, uh, a high number of the uh, paramedics across the country are already vaccinated, and so that's a really good thing. Uh, and uh, they're, you know, like it is with their general general population, there's growing there's growing on animosity uh, potentially between those that are vaccinated and those that are not, uh, and so that's a reality. We've seen uh, and have had uh, in various places in, in Canada, uh, Alberta and others being one of them where it's been mandated uh, for uh, all of the healthcare workers to be, uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, that comes with some complexity about what you do with those that aren't, uh, but uh, there's been a very strong stance. And like Tony said, uh, that has definitely driven towards increasing those vaccinations. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something that we have uh, the mandate is comes in place here end of October for us in Alberta, but in other places, it's uh, it got diff it has different dates. And uh, there are some, uh, you know, that's likely a step that we'll see significantly across Canada as, uh, you know, this wave increases and the challenge in managing this, uh, this grows. So. This is Brian from the U.S. I would uh, say ditto to the comments already made and only add the, in the U.S. I think there are just a handful of states who have mandated uh, health care workers. The governors of each state in our country have the authority to do that in most cases, uh, but there's only a handful that have. But what has also happened is uh, you know, systems who employ our providers, so health care systems, hospital systems, in some cases, uh, county governments, um, all across the U.S. Uh, in a very um, um, uh, quilt, a patchwork quilt-like manner have started to mandate and it's sort of creating those uh, lines. And, and I would agree, I think uh, it was Tony who, who used the word animosity. Uh, that exists. Uh, there are those who uh, are very displeased with partners who refuse to be vaccinated and others who are sympathetic. But um, um, I think that uh, time is just going to tell a lot of the mandates um, from a system level are going into effect as we speak in these current months of autumn. So um, we'll have a better picture of that, I think, in the months ahead. ahead. And, and similar, similar, and here, Gary, uh, similar here, Gary, in the UK, I think we're up about 90%. It's only a handful uh, now to finish off getting through the vaccines. I think it's young females of kind of childbearing age, I think, seems to be one of the one of the groups I think that's been a little bit of a challenge uh, for us in some communities from sort of black and ethnic minority backgrounds as well. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what the uh, 
what the uptake is of the flu vaccination and any booster vaccination program as well, because I think that's going to be a logistical, a real logistical challenge for us when we're so busy again, uh, and then trying to get everybody through boosters and uh, flu vaccinations and the gaps between the two or whatever they decide needs to happen. So, uh, yeah, a lot of work to do, I think, going forward in the next few weeks, months ahead around all of that. All right, well, uh, thanks to the association. Oh, go ahead, Hillary. Sorry, I was just going to come in on a slightly different point, just in terms of uh, one of the things we are noticing now is uh, PPE fatigue and, and staff getting really fed up with wearing PPE. And one of the things that we're doing as an association, we've commissioned um, a survey of all staff, not just frontline staff, all of our staff uh, looking at infection prevention and control and how that's been handled throughout the last two years their um, experience of it, their perception of it, and uh, their confidence in PPE, and uh, how it's affected their uh, attitude to work, whether they whether they wanted to come to work, stay away from work, whether it's affected their engagement with patients. So we're looking at it in the round in terms of how we can manage it better in the future, not just for pandemics, but just infection prevention control generally on a day-to-day -day basis whether we need to change our training regimes, um, whether we need to include more for our corporate staff, not just our frontline staff, because they've all been affected as, as well by this. Uh, so it's quite an extensive exercise that we're doing. And um, I'm sure that maybe when we get the results of that, it would be something we could share with you all just to, because uh, I'm sure it's not very different uh, around the world. All right, thank you. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. Uh, my name is near the end of the alphabet, and I always had to go last in school growing up. So um, for this last segment, we're going to go in reverse country alphabetical order. And I'd like each association just to take a minute or two to make any um, closing comments that you might have. And, uh, and then we'll um, call it a day. So let's start with NEMSMA. Well, thanks to everyone uh, who's participating and listening. Um, it's a bit reassuring to hear um, we share a lot of similar issues and we share the desire to help one another overcome them. I can uh, add to the conversation that um, in the United States, there's an agency, uh, it's a digital uh, media agency called ems1.com. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's obviously available around the world who partners an annually with an organization called Fitch and and the National EMS Management Association to do a survey. Uh, this year it was responded to by 2,400, 2,400 providers. Uh, the idea is to ask similar questions year after year to develop and understand trends, hence the name, the trend report. One of the learnings from this year's trend report is that the majority of respondents feel that COVID has made them better, made them better clinicians, made them better partners, made them better uh, uh, inter having better interactions with particularly public health in the United States. Um, I mentioned this in the recorded uh, message. Uh, part of what we're trying to do at NAMSMA is to make sure that despite the death and the challenges and the, the, the gut-wrenching stuff everyone is going through, uh, it is a leader's responsibility to provide a, a glimpse of optimism uh, amongst all of the things that we have going on in our world. So um, what I would say in closing uh, is I have optimism that collectively we are better than alone. And I'm very appreciative uh, on behalf of our association and our country with the work you are doing and your willingness to share that information. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, AA. Yeah, I just want to say again, thanks to everybody for joining and thanks to our staff and volunteers, not just in the UK, but across the world. There should be some staff perhaps and volunteers on the call today. And I just want to personally, you know, on behalf of all the ambulance chief execs in the UK, thank you for all you're doing. It's been certainly unprecedented times. I've been in the National Health Service for 33 years, 30 years this year in the ambulance sector, and it's certainly been the toughest in my my career without a doubt so I just want to thank everybody and let's keep up the collaboration as well you know there are so many similarities aren't there across the across our, our organizations uh, I think the only difference is the accents 
So I hope everybody's keeping up with my Scottish accent, but um, <laughs> let's continue to share ideas and share learning because that's the, that's the only way we'll improve things for our patients and our staff. All right, Paramedic Chiefs of Canada. Thanks, Gary, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, I know that this experience uh, has definitely helped my lens of uh, what we're doing right now uh, within uh, the Paramedic Chiefs of Canada, but also my, uh, you know, the local service and province that work in as to uh, what are these problems, what's happening across the country definitely informs what it is that we're going to do and, and uh, you know, perceptions on things like what's happening with our staff uh, really changes the picture when you hear that it's across the world, they're, they're seeing a number of the same things. And so the problem or the causality, or causa, cause, causality around these things uh, is really something that we need to understand better. And as Hillary said, uh, understanding what are the impact of patients, uh, you know, to patients around these things, really important, uh, you know, things that we need to think about. Uh, certainly concerned about uh, the mental health uh, of our staff and what this looks like, and I uh, hope that we can have uh, future uh, more global conversations around that, uh, the care fatigue piece that's uh, becoming apparent in, the, in this pandemic is substantial, and we're yet to understand exactly what that looks like. So uh, thank you again for uh, everybody that's contributed to this conversation and really look forward to having some future uh, topics as well. and the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Thanks, uh, and again, thank you. Uh, I must admit, I, I, from today, really reassures me in some ways to uh, to realise that, you know, the issues everyone's experiencing are very similar around the world. And um, in some ways, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, um, where because of the, the wave in which it's coming to us, we've got a lot of learning that we can take from uh, from, from our colleagues, uh, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. I, I think, the issues that, that really stood out to me today, obviously the, the issues around hospital transfer and that, that uh, transfer of care issue is one that is going to be a real issue. And really it's my, it's my biggest issue in responding right now. So I think it's, it, is, uh, it is something to, for us to continue to learn from each other. The mental health and wellbeing of our workforce and, and I echo everyone else's comment about just how incredibly proud we are of what everyone's been able to achieve. But, but it's coming at a toll. And I, I think understanding the recovery piece into the future will be really critical. How do we not just recover the way we respond to the community and learn from the things, the good things that have come out of this pandemic in the way we respond, but also how do we care for our people? And interesting, we're just undertaking a psychosocial survey at the moment of our staff. We do it every two years. And I think it will it will paint a very interesting picture of just how um, our staff are, uh, are, 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 are at at all levels of their psychosocial health. Um, so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity today to, to, to share in this and to learn from, from my colleagues. and. You, you sometimes feel a bit lonely in these jobs. It is, it is nice to, to, to reflect with others uh, um, who are experiencing a similar or have experienced similar things. So thank you. All right, everyone. Um, there are a couple of minutes left. Uh, we're gonna leave the line open for three more minutes, the uh, webinar uh, function. What we would like you to do is um, each one of you before you hang up, if you could just type in the chat box, whether you found today helpful if you would like to see GPLA do more of these in the future, and if so, if you have topic suggestions that uh, we might try to hit. So um, we're all just gonna be quiet now, let you type in your comments. Once you've typed in a comment, then you're free to disconnect. And uh, thank you so much for participating. And thanks for all of our panelists, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, Gary, for um, coordinating today's uh, meeting. We appreciate it. And um, it's another good example of our collective uh, leadership across the paramedic sector uh, globally. So um, thanks, Gary. See you soon.